our guest lecturer today is uh, Aaron Peterson. Aaron is the Executive Vice President of Sales at Prosper, Inc. Uh, prior to being at Prosper, uh, Aaron was the co-founder of Education Success, Inc. and managed Osagio LLC and was the regional sales manager for Eclipse Marketing in Southern California. So you can already tell he's an entrepreneur. He's been involved in several things. Uh, he been has been the president of the Perpetual Adoption Fund and sits on the board of directors of a Child's Hope Foundation. He has a bachelor's degree in international business with minors in economics and Spanish from uh, Albertson College of Idaho. A couple other things that are pretty interesting about him, just real quickly. He loves to ride bikes. I think I've read or understand sometimes as far as 200 miles. One race. One race that, okay. <laughs> And, and loves to fly fish. In fact, a film that they did um, about fly fishing in Costa Rica, I believe is airing this Sunday. Maybe he can tell you a little bit more of the details. So he has a lot of variety of interest. Um, his wife, with his wife Darla, who is not able to be here, they have four children, two of which are here. And so besides welcoming Aaron, I want Marin to stand up and Ashton to stand up. Marin is nine and Ashton is seven. So let's welcome them. This is their first time to Hawaii, so they got to come on a fun trip with their dad. So we're really get, glad to have you two with us. So without any further, um, let's go ahead and welcome Aaron Peterson today. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction, and Jay, thank you for the prayer. Um, aloha, I guess that's how we greet everybody here, and I also want to extend my best to those that are celebrating the Chinese New Year. You know, when people ask me where I'm from, I, you know, I'm from Idaho, and I always tell them that, they say, you know, Aaron, where are you from? I says, I'm from God's country. Because I just really like Idaho. I love the mountains, the waters, uh, the lakes. It's just a beautiful place, lots to do in the outdoors, but after being to, here in Hawaii, I think God's country has a rival as far as a beautiful place to be. It's just been fantastic. When I woke up Tuesday morning, um, it was 16 degrees in Rexburg, Idaho. I had to scrape the ice off my windshield before I could actually start driving, and I doubt any of you have that problem. So, Has anybody ever been to Idaho? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so very diverse group and exciting that... Um, that you guys have been there. And this is my first time to Oahu. I've been to Maui one time, but I've had uh, some really good friends of mine that attended you know, Brigham Young University Hawaii, and they had nothing good, but good things to say about it. We got here a little early this morning and spent some time over at the visitor center at the, at the temple, and it was just a fantastic experience. Um, and my children have already been introduced. I don't know why I was so fortunate and blessed to have such wonderful children, but two of them are here, and as you can see, they're great kids. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my story, where I came from, and kind of how I got into business and entrepreneurship. I just feel that that's important. For, for me, it was something that I always wanted to understand. Um, when m my wife and I we first moved to Utah, we lived in Orem, Utah, for about five years, and you know we, were, we built a home in Alpine, Utah, and Alpine, Utah was a nice area. It was a, you know, it was a, a prosperous area, and I know when we drive over there to check on the status of our home, I used to think. You know, what, what do these people do? What does that person do that lives there? And so as we got in the area, I always love to ask people, you know, how you came to where you are right now. And it was something that was always inspirational to me. And even as a you know, young child, I was always interested in people and how people came to, you know, get where they got to. I always felt like I could always learn something from them. But I grew up in Rexburg, Idaho my whole life. Um, first time I'd been on a plane is when I had uh, served a mission in uh, Connecticut. I spoke Portuguese there, which is kind of different, but that's where the first time I'd been on an airplane. And I grew up on a farm. You know, my stepdad had a farm. We had potatoes. We had cows, the whole nine yards. And one thing I really valued is I learned how to work, and I learned how to work hard. Um, I enjoyed sports growing up, and I had wrestled in high school and wrestled in college at Rick's College when they did have wrestling there. And so I'd learned how to do some hard things. Um, you know, I always remember when I was wrestling at Rick's College, you know, going to a New Year's party with my friends and realizing that I still had to lose six pounds by the next day and not be able to eat anything. And, 
And so it was something I appreciated. I learned how to do hard things. Um, and at college, when I was at Rick's College, I met Randy Garn. How many of you heard Randy Garn speak when he was here last time? And what an awesome individual. You know, we grew up together. He's from Sugar City, Idaho. I'm from Rexburg. We used to play Little League, wrestling, or, I mean, Little League football against each other. And he was just a ball of energy then, as he's a ball of energy now, as you guys can attest. But one interesting thing about Rick's college is it was our, it'd be our, our first year there at Rick's after our missions. Randy ran for student body president at, at Rick's college. I was his campaign manager. And the gentleman that he ran against was a gentleman named Ethan Willis. How many of you heard that name? You know, Ethan's actually our, our third partner in Prosper. So it's myself, Randy Garden, Ethan Willis. And we didn't know Ethan much at the time, but Randy ran against Ethan Wilson's for student body president. And Randy ended up winning, and we attribute that to our, our campaign. Um, we knew how to market, and we knew our target audience. We would get you know, our, our little nephews and nieces, and we'd get little puppy dogs, and we'd go around to the girls' dorms and say, have the nephews and nieces say, vote for Randy. And so we were able to target in on the people who would be voting, and Randy ended up being the student body president. And so that's how we met Ethan. Um, my first experience in the world of business came um, when I did door-to-door -door sales. I remember the first summer that I'd gone out, I'd sold pest control, and I went to Fresno, California. And I, I grew up on a farm. I'd got home from my mission just as school started in September, so I kind of missed out on that summer um, to work on the farm, and I'd went to school all year round. And I saw in the paper that you know, students were making a decent amount of money doing the door-to-door -door sales, and I thought, you know what? I believe I can at least be average. I feel that confident about myself. And when I was loading up my little Mon Mazda protege um, in the summer of 1997, um, as I was putting things in the trunk, my mom came out and said, you know what, honey? If it doesn't work out for, me, for you, you can always come back and work on the farm. And I was thinking in the back of my head, you know, and I, like I said, I loved growing up on a farm. I learned a lot of valuable things, but I was thinking in the back of my head, the last thing that I want to do is come back and work on the farm. You know, this is going to work. It's, I'm going to make it work, whatever I have to do. And I'll tell you, it was challenging. The first two weeks, I was in Fresno, California, and the first two weeks, I got one sale. You know, one sale, and everybody else in the office had gotten more sales than I had. So it was in my mind, you know, that's when maybe Satan starts to tempt you, or you might be able to doubt yourself. But I just stuck to what I believed that, you know what, I'm going to make it work, and ended up having a fantastic summer. And interesting enough, when we got back, I, we were finishing our second year at Rick's College, and I was in the library and ran into a guy, and I said, oh, you know, he, he, happened, he and I were the top first-year sales reps for Eclipse Marketing, and his name happened to be Ethan Willis. You know, so we were just kind of looking back and forth. And so it's interesting how, you know, God puts you in those places, and if you truly believe in your heart that you can accomplish something, you set out to do what you can. Um, so that gives you a little bit of idea of how I came to know my partners. Randy and I grew up together. Ethan, we'd sold pest control. We'd made the connection that we were the top sales reps for our first year there at um, Eclipse. And that next summer, we all went out together. We said, hey, it feels like, you know, we have a lot of the same beliefs. We... You know, same work ethics. Let's go out. We went to San Diego, California, and had just a fantastic summer as the top office for the company. Um, we soon found out that, you know, we really liked working with each other. We were pretty good at sales. So we started working with a seminar company, and this is how Prosper came about. We, we would, um, the seminar company we were working with, they would, they would have big name speakers who would go out on a circuit. They'd have people that would attract an audience, like Joe Montana, Colin Powell, George Bush. In between those big name speakers, they'd have product speakers. They were essentially selling their products. And one of the gentlemen we, we worked with was a gentleman by the name of Jay Mitten, and he was selling asset protection, tax strategies, estate planning in a box. You know, people would buy that box for, I don't know if it's twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500, but it was a, a good sized box that they would purchase. And so he'd go out there and he'd speak, he'd say, hey, this is what I'm offering. At the back table there, you have a chance to buy this product for this price. And we were the people at the back table um, selling his packages, taking orders. 
we soon decided that, you know, we're traveling all over. We're all newly married. The wives aren't real happy about the traveling all over. So we thought, you know, what if we gathered the names of everybody who attended those seminars and called them and followed up with what they had bought? And we found out we started having a lot of success. We were seeing, you know, weeks where we'd sell 20, 25,000 in sales off of people who attended the seminars but didn't purchase. We also soon found out that people that had bought that box, you know, where do I begin? That's a lot of information to dive into. And we found out that, you know what, if we could match them with somebody that could help walk them through the box, at least a starting point, and get them to where they were able to fill out their, you know, wills or trusts or charitable remainder trusts, that they were a lot happier. And they would pay more money for that. So rather than just getting the materials, if they could have a mentor or a coach walking through the process, we felt that we could um, create significant value for that at a higher cost. So at that point, um, we started moving into the role of coaching and mentoring. We felt if we can do this for these packages, we can offer a coach or a mentor for other areas. And one area that was hot at the time, and this is back in the 2000, 2001, was e-commerce. You know, people were just starting to get websites up and going, starting to drive traffic to it. And we had met a company that had, had an infomercial on TV called an, the Internet Treasure Chest, where people bought this program to get a website up and going. But what they didn't know is beyond that, what do they do? How do they drive traffic to their site? How do they market it? How do they create design? And so we started to create a niche where we would offer coaching and mentoring to these individuals as they bought this package. And we jumped into five different areas. And Prosper today, we educate in a distance learning company in six different areas. Real estate investing, stock market investing, personal financial management, personal development, e-commerce, and foreign currency trading. And over the years, it's just been amazing to see where our company has grown and where it's gone from you know, having us just as a sales team, because there's three parts to our business. There's that lead generation, there's the sales of the business, and there's fulfilling what you sell these individuals. And at the time, we were just a sales unit. That's what we were good at. But we started to learn the world of lead generation, started knowing how to you know, email marketing and contextual advertising and banner placements and different websites. Then we soon realized at that point that you know, as we were selling these individuals, we were outsourcing our education or fulfillment uh, to another company. But if a coach missed a session, or if the individual didn't like that coach, there wasn't much accountability because it wasn't people that had worked for Prosper. And so we dove into that and we created our own fulfillment department. And today, for the last six years, we've had our own fulfillment department. And it's just been amazing to see that there's a market out there for people that desire this type of education. Um, if, if you think about it, Let's say that somebody, you know, they are graduated from college, they have a job, but they want to make additional money. What are their options? You know, a lot of people say, well, they could go back to school. You know, they could start a business, they could get a second job, and those are all options. But we feel that Prosper, that we can create that niche, that we found a niche that people want, that if somebody does, if they do want to make additional money, and they don't want to go back to school, and they don't want that second job, our educational products are poised, help these individuals learn right now information that they can apply to start ma making money in the different related fields that they're studying. Um, you know, interesting, we took a survey. Our graduation rate at Prosper for people who start our programs and end up graduating is at 87%. And just comparing that with online universities, how many of you heard of University of Phoenix? Does anybody know what the graduation rate from University of Phoenix online is? 17%. So it was quite a bit lower than I had ever thought. I mean, that's just their online, their online graduates at 17%. Somebody who says, hey, I'm going to start and actually finishes. So we were pretty proud of that figure. And we attribute it to, you know, the high tech and the high touch, putting time and effort into our programs that somebody really feels like, hey, if we do this right now, we can apply it tomorrow and start making money. Matter of fact, as we um, surveyed our students to give us a, a score of one to five of where they grade us overall, we came in at a, came in at a 4.3. And so that gives you a little idea of Prosper and, and what we do. And this is where I believe that we're poised and where we found a niche in the market. You know, I've, I've done a lot of research the last little bit. And 
The cost of education, I mean, we're, we're in a new, unique situation. I live in Rexburg right now, which is Brigham Young University, Idaho. Our corporate office is in Provo, Brigham Young University, and obviously here at Brigham Young University of Hawaii. It's very unique that we have a, a university, an area of study, where our costs haven't been going up as dramatically as the rest of the rest of the world. Um, I saw an article in The Economist, which is a traditionally a pretty liberal um, publication, but the cost of education in the last five years has nearly doubled. And they had even noted in The Economist that some universities are doing some fantastic things like Brigham Young University, uh, Idaho, about their track system and year-round you know, students. And so the cost of education has gone up double in the last five or six years. What about the quality of education? It's pretty much stayed about the same, right? Pretty much even. In a lot of those universities where cost is doubled. There's been technology to help things out. But this all of a sudden creates a, an issue. And you've maybe seen this on the news over the last little bit. But somebody, they, they go and apply for um, loans, you know, student loans. And these student loans now, instead of being 20000 a year, might be 40000 a year. They graduate. Their hope and dream is that they're going to get a job that's going to pay back the $160,000 that they borrowed to attend a university. And they're, fighting, they're finding out that in an economy where unemployment's around 10%, that's a difficult thing to do. And I stumbled across, to, across an article on moneycnn.com, and it gave five scenarios. It, 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 it picked five students who had done just that, who had paid for their university, had paid for money to go to the university. They had studied in their field of expertise. One was an engineer who went to a a specific engineering school in Pennsylvania, specifically for his field, and hadn't found a job yet, but he was $212,000 in debt. And it, it is, if you start to think about that, that creates quite an issue you know, for the world out there. And that's where we felt up prosper, that you know, we, we can come in, you know, our, our average program is about six, $7,000, that somebody applies this, you know, if it is a, a single mom that has kids, she's got to take care of her kids, this is something she can do from home. These are principles that she can apply at her house, you know, to, to start making money. And that's where we feel, I, I really feel like the face of education is going to be changing. There will always be brick and mortar education. But I think what students are saying now is they want to be educated their way in a certain way. And you have organizations out there, like how many of you ever heard of the, the ConAcademy.org? A couple of you. It's pretty amazing all the free information they have on videos where you can learn information. And I think education's trending that way, where there's going to be a lot of things that you can receive, but the type of education that he might want or that she might want, maybe it's direct. It's with a mentor. That's how I learn best. If somebody sits me down and says, hey, Aaron, you messed up here. Think about this. What would you do in this situation? And gives me feedback on it. And so I think as the face of education is changing and people express a different way to be educated than just a standard um, one-on-many platform, I believe that you're going to see different organizations and entities pop up that cater towards that. Because if you think about how you learn best, like I said, I, I learn best one-on-one. -on -one. Some learn best on themselves. You give them books, you give them materials, they dive into those materials and they can dissect it and they can internalize it very good. Some learn really well one-on-many where somebody might you know, lecture, give a presentation. Um, some might, might learn well in a peer-to-peer, -a, -peer, a group setting. And we provide all those different platforms at Prosper. Um, at this point, I wanted to jump in what I thought are very important characteristics that make somebody a successful entrepreneur. And after that, I'm gonna talk about some of the lessons that I've learned. Because it hasn't just been you know, blue skies and sunshine on the road to getting our business started. There's been challenges, there's been bumpy roads, there's been some scary times. And I want to talk about what a 36-year-old Aaron would go back and tell his 24-year-old Aaron, and so I'll dive into that in a second. But here's some characteristics that I feel very strongly about um, that make a, a very good entrepreneur. The first one is optimism. You know, you're going to go through your life one way or another, and it's just, to me, so much happier. It's so much better. There's much better energy about you and those that you surround yourself with if you're optimistic. My partner, Randy, he bleeds optimism. 
You know, you cannot tell Randy that it's a bad day. There's never a bad day for Randy. And I strive to be like that. But if you constantly believe and you hope for the good things that are out there, you're going to attract those things to you. I think belief is one of them, believing in yourself. I shared with you the example that I had is when I was selling pest control. You know, that I, I was determined that, you know what, when my wife says, honey, it's okay, you can come back and work on the farm, that I wasn't going to be going back and working on the farm, that I was going to make it work. You know, it's, it's about perspective. There's a, a parable of a gentleman who, or of two shoemakers in the country of Spain, you know, and they want to expand their business. Both of them, you know, it's a, it's a family-run business. Both of them send their sons down to Morocco because they were going to expand the shoe business there. Both of them observe, they see the same thing, nobody's wearing shoes. A few people wearing sandals, but for the most part, nobody's wearing shoes. Both sons go back and report on what they saw in the country of Morocco to their fathers in their shoe business in Spain. One son says to his dad, Dad, nobody's wearing shoes, you know. Dad, nobody's wearing shoes in Morocco. We have a great opportunity. There's no shoes there. We can penetrate the market. We can offer shoes to everybody. The next person comes back and says, Dad, there's no shoes in Morocco. You're never going to sell any shoes. So even though they observed and witnessed the same thing, one's optimistic view on it was that it was a fantastic opportunity. The other person who witnessed the same thing, his view was there was no opportunity, even though they saw the same thing. How many of you have ever seen that happen? You know, I understand that you know, the individual who started FedEx, when he put his business plan together at Harvard, he got a C minus on it, and on the paper said this would never work. I guess, you know, he, I don't know if he ever sent a letter back, but it's obviously worked and it's worked quite well. So one thing entrepreneurs do is they see opportunities where others might not see it. R relate that to the gospel a little bit. Um, there's a scripture in Ether, and I think we all know this, um, where the Lord will help weak things become strong. And, you know, for, for times in my life, there was times where I, I had challenges to learn things. I, I didn't learn them the exact same way that Mont did or that Jerry did or my friends did. I had to learn a little bit different way. But as I came into business, learning those things a different way well, actually became a strength to me where I could view a business concept or a strategy in a different way because I had, had to learn it a different way. At the time, I thought, man, this is a weakness. This is a challenge for me. You know, that's the beautiful thing about our Father in Heaven who knows things that we don't know at this time. Those challenges that I faced at those times, those weaknesses, eventually became my strengths where it benefited me in the long run. But it was hard for me to see at the time. And so if you ever find that, man, this is a weakness that I have, it's a challenge, know that as you continue to work on it and you push through with optimism, with faith in our Heavenly Father, that that weakness will eventually become a strength. Um, the, another one is just being positive. I think we've all met people out there in the world that it doesn't matter what's going on, everything's bad. And they're difficult people to be around. Um, you know, I had a good friend of mine who, you know, went from, you know, being, being a fairly positive individual and faced some challenges in his life, and he just continued to struggle to where almost anything you ask him about, it's met with just frustration and negativity. And that's hard to be, that, that's, that's hard to be around. You know, what... I think that the most important piece of real estate that any of you will, will ever own is the piece of real estate between your ears and what you tell yourself. What conversations do you have with yourself when nobody else is listening? Is it positive? Is it belief? Can you accomplish it? Or are you, or are you your worst enemy? Are you the one holding yourself back? As an entrepreneur and somebody who takes a risk, you can't do that. You have to believe. I, I, I believe very firmly that if it's right up here, it's going to come out right, right here as well. Um, fourth thing is focusing on things that, that you, you can control. There's so many things in the world that we can't control that if you try and focus on those things that you have no control over, life gets pretty frustrating. It can get pretty challenging. And we have enough things that are in our control that we should worry about that, um, that we should focus our energy on that. You know, it's just like, well, I can't do this today. The weather's horrible. Well, you can't control the weather. You can't control how somebody... Uh, you know, somebody's reaction to you. But you can control the way that you react to that, how your attitude is toward that. 
And the fifth thing is just to have a very firm vision of what you want to accomplish. And I'll tell you a, a, an interesting story. You know, the, the lifeblood of our business is, is leads. And typically, a, a lead to somebody at Prosper is somebody who's bought something. They've expressed interest in one of those related fields about starting an online business or getting started in real estate. Well, if they don't buy anything, chances are they're more difficult to convert. And that's one of the things we look at in our business is conversion rate. The other thing we look at is called dollar per lead, meaning that if you have 100 leads and you sell them $15,000 in educational programs, that's $150 a lead. And obviously, the higher dollar per lead, the better the lead is. Well, at one point in our business, um, one of our partners that we worked with, Robert Allen, wanted to give us these leads. They had spent zero dollars. They had just filled out a couple of questions. Um, but one of the questions, the very first question, it says, I want you to detail out your vivid vision. And that vivid vision, some people write three or four pages. And a standard dollar per lead in our business is about $150 a lead. Any ideas what dollar per lead we got on those non-buyer vivid vision leads? $450 a lead. Almost triple what any of those other were. And I firmly believe it's because somebody had a vision of what they wanted to accomplish. So when we encountered them, they were ready to move forward. They had already made the decision beforehand that they were going to change something. And, and, and for myself, this is very important. And so I look at this as what I call the ABCs for you creating your vision. A is what do you absolutely want? And that's got to be very powerful. That's got to be a vision, a vivid vision to you that you detail out what you want to accomplish. If you had asked me you know, 10 years ago what, what my vivid vision was, I could tell you exactly what it is. I'm not quite there, but it's still there. It's where I want to live, what I'm living in, what I'm living close to, what my home looks like, what my family looks like. It's very vivid. It's a goal, but it's more than a goal. It's a vision that you want to accomplish. So what do you absolutely want? Vividly detailed out. B is, what are the benefits of you getting what you absolutely want? What will happen if you create this vivid vision? If you actually, if it becomes reality, what are the benefits of that? And C is, what are the consequences? Some people are motivated by the carrot, some people by the stick. What if you don't accomplish that? What's going to happen? What are the consequences of you not living up and creating your goals? So what do you absolutely want? What are the benefits of creating what you absolutely want? What are the consequences? And then just a, 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 quick, um, a, a quick study on that. It was an independent group um, that they focused on training. And they focused on goals and writing down goals. They said people who say, hey, I want to accomplish something, will accomplish that goal 5% of the time. If somebody writes it down, that goes up to 22%. If somebody writes that goal down and you know they tell it to somebody, it goes up to 56%. If somebody writes down that goal, they give it to somebody and they tell that person to hold them accountable to it, it goes up to 90%. So you can see by just telling yourself you're gonna do something, you have about a 5% chance of accomplishment, but Telling yourself you want to do something and writing it down, giving it to somebody who will hold you accountable, whether that's a spouse, a close friend, a professor, your chances of accomplishing that raise dramatically, up to 90%. Um, really quick, I want to dive into just lessons that I've learned. Um, one thing I found out is, you know, having, if you're going to go into business, if you're going to go into business with partners, having the right partners. I've heard horror stories of people who've gone into business and had the wrong partners. And, it, it, and it's, it's a hard thing to deal with. You may say, okay, well, how do I get the right partners? It starts with, um, do you have the same belief system as them? If you're in a business with a partner, you start to see them do things that maybe are against your guys' belief system. If it's something that's dishonest, if it's something that's gonna take advantage of somebody else, you know, in a, in a very negative way, that might be your first indicator. Finding out about your partners is very important. And I found this out early on. You know, and this is a long story, so I'm gonna make it, uh, because of time, make it short. But, you know, at one point in Prosper's career, we were doing really well. In about 2003, we had a group come out and say, hey, we wanna buy you guys. And it was a company out of Kansas City. We didn't know much about them, but they said, hey, we own this company, Innovative Software Technologies. Here's the ticker symbol. This is trading at like $3.50 in the market. 
and we'll buy you guys out through stock. And, you know, being young and not, not very experienced, we, we, we did the deal. And we did it with um, some, thank goodness, some time to review everything. But we were in the deal about, um, oh, about four months, three, four months. The stock that we had got to buy us out that was at $3.50, by month four, it was trading at six cents. So we, we just decided at that point, Randy, Ethan, and I went to the temple grounds in Provo. We didn't go inside the temple, but we went up there and we each prayed and said, help us. Heavenly Father, what do we have to do? And we came back and said, we're going to fight like crazy, like nobody's ever fought before to get our company back. And we got our company back through a lot of legal fees, a lot of challenges, but we were able to get our company back. But we gave up, you know, essentially the assets and cash that we had, which was nearly at that time about four or five million dollars. But you know what? It was worth it because those were partners we didn't want to have to deal with. And we we're back working with the partners that had the same values that we did. It was a tough learning experience, but that's what life's about is learning. And I said, we could have focused on the negative or we could have focused on things out of our control, but we chose to focus on what we could control and how we would move forward with it. Um, another example, there was, I think having values in business is very important, you know, doing the right thing. Um, there was an account that we worked for a long time with Frank Kearns. He was an internet guru. And I remember we'd stopped the relationship with Frank after about six months. About seven, eight months after we'd stopped the relationship with Frank Kearns, we got a sale from a lead that Frank Kearns had given us. And, you know, our accounting department says, well, we haven't worked with Frank forever. We don't have the account. And we says, no, send the check, send the appropriate check to Frank Kearns. You know, it's his lead. He gave it to us. Let's, you know, send the lead to him. All of a sudden, about three days later, we got a call from Frank Kearns saying, I can't believe you guys have done that. I've worked with four or five coaching floors. And I'm worried every week if they're even going to send me what they really did, let alone you guys sending me something that happened from a lead I gave you eight months ago. From that, Frank Kern said, hey, there's a gentleman who's just getting into this industry, and he's looking for a coaching floor. His name's Sean Casey. Let me give you his number. We called Sean Casey. He met with Sean Casey. Sean Casey was a partner with Prosper for three and a half years, and we did roughly $35 million in sales from Sean Casey leads over that three-year period of time. So where we served best to do what was right, we were that little bit, I mean, sending Frank Kearns a check for $1,200 turned into $35 million by doing the right thing. If we would have just said, yeah, Frank's not going to know, just keep the money, we would have never seen that other account. And so blessings do come from doing it the right way. Um, the other thing I mentioned is just having a team that really, that you trust and it has your best interest, whether it's a a father, a professor, a father-in-law, just somebody that when you get in those situations and a company says, hey, we want to buy you guys. You know, Randy didn't come from a wealthy family. His dad was a, a football coach at high school. My dad was a farmer. and we, we were the poor farmers in Idaho. The, the tractor that I drove didn't even have doors on it. You know, it wasn't one of those big air-conditioned ones with a radio. So we didn't have a lot of money. And Ethan's father died when he was 18, and they didn't have a lot of money. And so we didn't... You know, so one thing that would have served us well is by um, having individuals that we trusted. So when those companies come to you and say, we want to buy you out and give you this stock, we could go to somebody and say, a, a team that we've um, formulated, what do you think about this? So as you begin your business, formulate a team. Um, oh, one other thing, and this is very important before we you know, end, end with questions, but... Um, what other piece of advice I would give you is listen to the prophets. I gave a talk in Sacra meeting back in, I think, 2001, 2002. And it was a talk given by Gordon B. Hinckley. And I don't remember. It was about loyalty. And one of the specific quotes I used from Gordon B. Hinckley was he said, there's a portent of stormy weather on the horizon. And if you think back to 2002, 2003, I bet people would listen to that and say, He's an older man. Maybe, maybe he's crazy. Maybe he doesn't know what's going on. But because 2003, 2004, 2005, things were booming. Real estate was doubling and tripling. And I, you know, when we diversified in our business, we'd bought some real estate. 
I made some good decisions in real estate, but I made some bad decisions in real estate. And I wish that I could have gone back that day and said, take to heart what President Hinckley said. Because shortly after that, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, a lot of that came to a crashing halt where real estate prices were about 25% of value of what they were when you bought them in 2005, 2006. And so give heed to the prophets. We are in such an amazing, unique situation to have a living prophet today that speaks to the Lord and he knows what we, knows what we'll go through. He gives us advice. When he says do this, when he says food storage, when he says pay off debt, those are real things. And I can attest to that and testify that listening to a prophet blesses your lives more than you know in all sorts of different ways. So that's a piece of advice that I'd really give to everybody listening. Um, you know, lastly, just on some of the values that I feel are important going into business is, and this is one I've always tried to live by, is putting the Lord first. When you put the Lord first, great things happen in all aspects of your life. Um, you know, early on in our, our career, you know, I remember Randy and Ethan, we were workaholics. I didn't have any kids yet, but my wife came and said, Aaron, hey, I want to go to Park City. Let's, you know, go shopping. We need to get a few things. Um, can you be done at 4.30? And I remember going to Randy and say, hey guys, it was about four o'clock, say, hey, I gotta leave about 30 minutes. We're like, oh, we have this, you know, we're gonna talk about this. And I said, you know what, I, there'll be times in our career that I'll probably disappoint you guys, I'm human. But one person I don't wanna disappoint is my wife. You know, and so this is a situation where I don't wanna disappoint her. And they respected that. And, you know, kind of drew a line in the sand at that point that family was important, family was first to me. You know, and as you get started in business, I've seen many business owners who, I mean, they spend hours, hours in their business. And sometimes you might need to do that initially, but one thing that I would not trade or exchange is, you know, when I go home at night, you know, I, I spend time with my family. You know, I, I coach the Little League football, Little League wrestling and baseball and soccer, even though I don't know baseball and soccer. You know, as I wanna spend time with my, my family, because. As a father, you really can't set the reset button. The start over button doesn't happen because they don't start over. You know, and I don't know what I, I did to be blessed with such wonderful children, but there's two of them here and two others that are home with mom. And you know, they're, they're wonderful children. And early on in our marriage, my wife and I had challenges getting pregnant. And when I was young, I thought, well, people didn't have kids because they didn't wanna have kids. There's a lot more that goes into it than that that I soon found out. And you know, our oldest, Marin, is adopted. And our youngest, Grayson, is adopted, and Ashton has a twin sister, twin sister Mesa. You know, and they were born early, and Mesa uh, has cerebral palsy. She's in a wheelchair. You know, it doesn't walk or talk, but... Sorry, I only cry when I talk about my family. Other than that, I'm fairly tough, but she's our angel. And I tell them, you know, Marin and Grayson, you know, they know they were adopted, but they know that... Um, they just got in the wrong line in heaven, and it just took them a little different route to come to get to our family. And I really believe that. And I believe as you put the Lord first, and that you put your family first, good things will happen in business. I'm a firm believer in that, and I testify of that. Um, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And before we open up to questions, I did wanna talk to you about the, the business plan competition. Um, in the last year, I've sat on three committees um, to be a judge for business, business plan competitions. And I've seen some really good ones and I've seen some ones that weren't so good. And as you create a business plan, I, one recommendation I'd give you, you've, you've gotta think about what, you, you've gotta think in numbers as well as what you're gonna create. You've gotta think about the market that your product's gonna be in. You've gotta think about your competition and what is gonna set you apart from your competition? And you've gotta have projections of numbers to back those up. You've gotta have realistic costs in there. And so it's gotta be really well thought out when you, when you do this business plan competition. And so this isn't to scare anybody, this is to help you understand on what prepares a, a good business plan. And the one, one we did for the city of Rexburg, um, we awarded $5,000 to a gentleman who um, the name of his company that he's promoting to start is called Siphon Soundware, where he has earphones that are inside pads that just sit against your ear that he would put in hats and 
beanies and it's not plugs that go in your ears and it's just, anyway, he was awarded $5,000 and it sounds like the prizes here are gonna be very similar. Um, one of the companies that I sit on the board of directors for is a company called Business Plan University. And we're just diving into that world. Most business plan companies, they have a template, you know, where you enter information and they spit you out a business plan. Business Plan University, the goal behind that is to educate you at each aspect of the business plan. Because if you go talk to somebody about your business plan, if you're trying to get funding, there needs to be substance behind what you're talking about, not just, hey, here's my business plan. And to do that, for everybody that participates in that business plan competition that goes tonight in these series and that participates in it, we're going to give you access to our of business plan um, software, business plan competition so or business plan university software that's valued about four hundred ninety nine dollars. And so I'll coordinate with Brother Tanner, you know, and um, you know, and the Johnsons to send me an email with everybody's name that's going to participate in that, and I'll make sure that we give you access to the Business Plan University software. It's a fairly new company that we're getting up and going, and so it'll be a benefit for us as well to check out the software, but it is, it's really good stuff. A lot of time and money has been put into it to get it to where it is today. So, all right, and any questions or, or, I know we're getting short on time, but. You know, I will say one thing, and feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions, but, you know, one of my passions is, is, is fly fishing that Brother Tanner talked about, and so I will mention that, you know, we went to Costa Rica and we filmed a, a fly fishing movie um, called the Costa Rica Challenge, and the goal behind that was to catch uh, three different species of fish in 36 hours from coast to coast. On the Caribbean side, we'd catch a tarpon. Um, we'd float through some of the mountain rivers of Costa Rica and catch a native fish to Costa Rica called a machaca. And then we'd end up on the Pacific coast, and, Pacific coast and catch a sailfish all on a fly and do it in 36 hours. And so it's airing this Sunday on the World Fishing Network, which is on Dish Network, or there's apps you have on the iPhone or iPad or even on the internet, the World Fishing Network. But it's kind of fun, fun group of guys I go with. They're a lot funnier than I am and a lot crazier than I am. But um, anyway, I, I, and you know, it's something that... The World Fishing Network has asked us to do five more episodes this year, so we're going to be traveling to Costa Rica uh, sometime in the next you know, 60 to 90 days. But the other thing about getting a business up going, if you're something you're passionate about and you stick with it, good things can happen, even if it's you know, fly fishing. My wife will, everybody will ask me, well, how often do you go? I say, not enough. My wife says, too much. So it's probably somewhere in, in the middle there. So, Any question? question in the back? Good question. You know, there's probably uh, probably about four or five businesses that I have right now. And the main one that takes probably, you know, 35, 40 hours is Prosper. That's the one that, you know, we've had the most success with. That's what takes, we have the most employees, feeds our family. You know, the other ones, kind of some fly fishing stuff, that's just some passion, pa something I'm passionate about. That it's easy, like at night when... I'm looking over pictures that I've taken when I've been out fly fishing that I can post, post to my website. Or if I want to go fish salt water anyway, might as well take a camera crew with you and, and film it and, and then you'll hire them to do the work. So it, it, in that regard, it's easy to transition in between them because one's a passion that I'm doing anyway and one is the core business that I focus most of the time on that we really spend strategy on. Um, but anyway, great question. Thank you. Yes. What's the name of your website? Um, for fly fishing? The, the one's flyfishingfrenzy.com. And interesting story about that. Just about, about 12 years ago, I said, hey, honey, me and some friends are going to go fishing. And, you know, and we're going to be gone for about three or four days. She's like, three or four days? I'm like, well, yeah, it's our friend's fly fishing frenzy forever. You know, I was like, it's, it's our first annual one. She's like, what? And so anyway, 12 years later, we've been on 12 friends fishing trips, and we originally started that as just a blog spot website to put pictures on because some of my friends live in Utah, some live in Idaho, that we could just post pictures to it. But yeah, it gets quite a bit of traffic now, but it's Fly Fishing Frenzy, and then the Costa Rica Challenge.com is another website that talks a little bit about the challenge, so. Yes? What's your favorite fish to eat? To eat? You know, I really like mahi-mahi uh, and tilapia. 
No, I've never caught any of those on a fly. My favorite one to catch that I've caught on a fly is probably a trout. So, yes. You know what? I did it four years. It was. You know, and that last summer was kind of, Ethan, Randy, and I, um, they started a, a marketing company and I sold for them. That was kind of some of the funds that gave us to start Prosper. So, but it was a great training ground to learn how to, to sell and believe in yourself and, and, you know, deal with rejection. Yes? Good question. Can you repeat this question too? Yes, she just asked, tell us what our typical client looks like at Prosper. And we actually did a survey of our clients. 65% of them have a college grad or college graduates. Um, the average age is between 35 and 44. And it's people that already have a job, most of them, I would say about 70% have a job, but they're looking for additional income. You know, they're looking for how to make money online or they know that and her uncle's making money in real estate. They're able to buy homes at a really good price right now and able to flip them and make some money. Or they have some money. They're a doctor or a dentist that wants to trade on their own in the stock market. They have some funds set aside, um, but they want to do it by themselves. You know, or somebody that just, I, I've got a lot of debt and I need to know how to get this under control. So it, it is just that person that's looking to either get out of debt or make additional money but not spend 40 hours doing it, maybe 10, 15, 20 hours a week to do it. Yes? And is this online or in person? Now? It's all on online. And so those coaching conversations, they're actually done over the phone. And it's done with an interactive tool. We use either Join Me or Glance, where our coaches can actually go on and you know, take control of the student's computer and show them different things. But there's two phases of our coaching. There's the proactive phase and the reactive phase. That proactive phase is where you're going to have four to six months, or three to six months, meeting each week or every other week with your co coach through phone, fax, and email. After that, they have access to our online system, which is webinars, conference calls, um, group coaching sessions, and online libraries and tutorials that they have access for the whole entire year. So that first part, that proactive, is the interaction with the coach. And then after that, we try and provide... Like I said, as many methods of learning as possible um, so these people can continue to learn and learn how they learn best. So. Yes? How did you gain the knowledge, like such a wide variety of things to deal with everybody and everything? Like, like in our Prosper coaching? Yeah, he, oh, sorry. He, he had asked, how did I gain um, a wide knowledge to be able to educate and teach people in these different areas that Prosper offers. Is that right? You know, first off, I'm not that smart. I'll be the first to tell you that. But I'm smart enough to know that I need smart, smart people to help me. And so when we first got going, our first program was Stock Market. And myself and Jason Colum, who's been with the company for 12 years, he's our president and chief operating officer, we compiled the first Stock Market Manual. But what we soon found out is there were smarter people out there that had experience in those different areas. And so we leveraged other people's knowledge to put these programs together. And then once we had a base of curriculum and stock market, real estate and internet, those were our first three courses. As those coaches started educating people on it, we soon found that our brain trust was in our own coaching office. And so we developed a product development team that actually works with the coaches to continue to update information. And our product development team continues just to research those specific topics that we educate on to make sure that we're always up to speed. You know, and what we teach people on, it's not, you know, super groundbreaking. It's stuff that people are doing anyway. Just a lot of people don't know about it or how to do it. It's like, take getting out of debt, for example. There's a lot of people who, you know, are in debt, but they've never learned some of the fine principles of, you know, paying off one debt, then applying all that to another one, paying that down and just moving the money, you can accelerate your debt payoff a lot faster that way. So. One, or two more one or two more questions. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. You guys have been fantastic, and I really appreciate your audience. Thank you.